Greetings and salutations, my beautiful people, and welcome back to my little show called Canis Retrospectives! Where I take a look at the first three of any video game franchise. And it seems as though part two of this retrospective has come careening towards us at top speed. So what I'd suggest to- And we've got a lot to cover, as now we've hit the very controversial Metal Gear Solid 2. So let's begin. So Metal Gear Solid on the original PlayStation was an international hit, and Hideo frickin' Kojima got his well-deserved big break. However, Mr. Kojima was a man of no idleness, and he had already finalised a design document for a sequel in 1999. After he heard about the specs and the hardware for the PS2, Kojima had decided to innovate along with the console and provide his loyal audiences with, and I quote, something completely new. A big prissy go. Well, not just that, but basically improve everything. He mainly wanted to focus on presentation in the field of facial expressions and body language, but then he thought about the surroundings and how the player and the enemies could interact around them. He had the power! And when Mr. Kojima had the power, he was an unstoppable powerhouse. So unstoppable that even his own marriage was in crisis after so much work went into this sequel. So much so that for shits and giggles, he added in a codec call within the game based on an argument that him and his lucky lady had one night. But the main question is, for probably one of the most anticipated video game sequels in history, was Kojima's marital status worth sacrificing for- oh, sorry, that's just horrible. What I mean is, was this excessive dedication worth it for this sequel? And the answer is a well and resounding yes. So let's talk about what happens. This game was based around two chapters, the Tanker chapter acting as the prologue and the Big Shell chapter. The Tanker chapter revolved around a familiar voice retelling a flashback from two years after the Shadow Moses incident from the last game. Snake and Otacon now work with a non-governmental anti-Metal Gear company called Philanthropy and are investigating a shipment of a brand new Metal Gear model called Ray, a faster, more agile and even deadlier weapon than before that could actually swim underwater. And this was all taking place on a disguised oil tanker. However, the plan go shit all up the walls and all over the floor and oh good lord I'm not cleaning that up it's everywhere my precious bathroom oh my god when a group of Russian terrorists attack the ship aided by revolver ocelot from the last game then it turns out that ocelot betrays the Russians after he is possessed by the genes of liquid snake whose arm they attached onto ocelots after his arm was taken off by the ninja in the last game <gasps> And then he steals the new Metal Gear model and sinks the entire tanker with Snake still on board, not only supposedly killing Snake, but causing the biggest oil spill disaster for decades. Two years later and the game centers around everyone's favorite pudding, Raiden, investigating a supposed oil cleanup facility called the Big Shell, which has been seized by another group of terrorists called the Sons of Liberty, run by Snake's unknown second genetic brother, Solidus Snake, who are all part of a unit called Dead Cell. They demand that the US government give them $30 billion in cash, or else they'd kill the US president who they have hostage, and destroy the entire facility and basically kill the entire ocean with oil. It's always about the oil, isn't it? But then after that, as you'd expect, plot twists, new characters, antagonists changing their fucking minds every 10 minutes, and another conspiracy is uncovered involving one of my favourite video game secret organisations, the Patriots. Fun fact. Did you know that this game pays homage to the Titanic? The intro of the game is based around a sinking ship and then features around two of our main characters in love called Jack and Rose. Similarly, Snakes and Otacon's real names, David and Hal, reference 2001, A Space Odyssey. Now isn't that lovely? There's a lot to talk about with this game, as you probably all very well know, but Maybe you don't want to hear my opinions on it, but <clears throat> fuck it, I'm just going to splurge them all everywhere. Not only were the controls, graphics, length, variety, mechanics, and basically everything improved, but Kojima was a very busy savage badger in trying to completely revolutionise how we see gaming. Within the stapled lengthy codec calls and cutscenes, he included some brilliantly complex and really dangerous and risky themes, including memes, social engineering, artificial intelligence, political conspiracies, censorship, child abuse, free will, sexuality, and even incest. And another risk being with the plot complexity and the new protagonist. But I've never seen so much effort go into creating a convoluted and confusing, yet so deep and insanely well-constructed story, further expanding on the world of Metal Gear and surprising the fuck out of everybody. Well, at least me, anyway. I love it. I don't care what you think. And not only was the plot a little controversial, or arguably ridiculous, but so was the introduction of the well-loved, crowd-favourite, universally-approved Raiden. 
everybody's favorite prissy little naked blonde cartwheeling sissy nugget. And I've got to be honest, guys, apart from one or two major lines that he says, I don't really have that much of a problem with him. I think the main problem I have with him is that his voice acting kind of sticks out like an embarrassing erection in places. He really doesn't sound like what his character would suggest. He sounds about 15. It's like being in a nightmare you can't wake up from. Maybe it was something to do with Kojima's desire to make a relatable protagonist for women. <laughs> I don't know, but I still found him an interesting character, and what people don't seem to realise is that he actually does a great thing. He makes Snake look even better than he already was. That, and when I first played this game directly after 1, I kept on playing deep in vain, hoping that I would see Snake again. And I also loved how Kojima didn't mention Raiden in any trailers, box art, or anything until you found him yourself. I still believe that was a stroke of genius. Kojima, you clever bastard. But I see the whole Raiden thing kinda like Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. When that movie came out, the hate it got was unbelievable. Ah, the Chinook fridge. Ah, it has aliens in it. Ah, it's so sick. Ah. Shut up, you fools! You know, because Indy never, ever, ever, ever did any stupid shit in any other movie before that one. People, it's an action adventure movie. Lighten up. I've got to say, I really don't get it, guys. But the same applies to this game. People hate this game solely on the fact that Raiden's in it. And you know what? For all of you people, the hell with you. Anyway, let's just keep talking. The stealth elements, camera movements and such were all the same, but like Crash, they had been amplified. I can ramble about the cardboard boxes and riding in the postal belt. <laughs> But let's talk about the main differences. The skills given to you were insanely expanded. You could walk slowly to sneak around and stop making noises around metal grates to attract attention, and hang over ledges to avoid the enemies. You could also aim in first person, meaning firing at cameras, and different damage reactions depending on where you shoot enemies, not to mention shooting the environments to distract them, such as fire extinguishers. Not to mention the corner mechanic was enhanced, allowing you to peek around corners and take cover while you're fighting or sneak attack. If you didn't feel like killing though, it's okay, because you could hold up any enemy and threaten them, allowing you to just take their stuff. Just aim at the head, or the... Place that shall not be named. And then they'll give in. You could also beat the entire game without killing a single guard due to the tranquilizer weaponry, and other methods of evasion, instead of just breaking necks or outright shooting. You could also open and hide in lockers, or tranquilize or kill other guards and hide them in lockers. But why would you want to do that? Because the enemy AI was amped to full, and it was also called the best AI for many years. Because you see, they would notice the body and call HQ out of suspicion. The same applies if you miss a shot, or they hear gunfire. The alert system was close to the original, but you could avoid it or trigger it in many other different ways, and a few more niches were added in to correspond to how the guards were feeling and seeing, and they even assessed the situations themselves and decided what status to go to and whether or not to call anybody about it. And these guys acted like raptors. They worked in packs, kept connected to each other, called for backup, surrounded you if threatened, and cut off your escape routes. I mean, it was a collective and deadly AI, and it made getting spotted practically hell if you did. And you better be careful with sending the head of a team to sweep, because if he doesn't report to HQ, they'll send men to kill you. But then you could also shoot out their radios to stop that happening, so meh. And enemies were even more of a threat when they carried stronger weapons and riot shields and blind shoot around cover, so this time stealth was absolutely critical if you wanted to survive. Not only were these elements improved, but so was the exquisite detail in this game. Just for a few examples, you could shoot practically anything, anywhere, and you'd get a reaction. Not just with walls, but even including bottles and fruit. Not to mention the game looked beautiful. And other little things, like when you held up enemies, and they didn't seem too scared of you, then you could shoot their hand or something and then they'd get the idea and cooperate. And Snake and Raiden react to things like temperature, like catching colds to give yourself away, smells, weather, and atmosphere. Pressure sensitive controls allowed you to put down a ready weapon by gently letting go of the button. Instead of randomly shooting somewhere else and wasting a bullet once the weapon was ready to fire, you can fuck around during the codec calls. <laughs> I mean, nearly anything is possible. And that rain effect on Snake on the tanker... Awesome. The detail is even visible in the extensive amount of Easter eggs in the game, which... Oh god, there's far too many to even think about. You can search for them all if you want, because some of them are pretty damn cool, but mm, it's pretty difficult, so to give you a head start, 
just go to random places and codec call random people. Try maybe a ladies bathroom. Or take pictures of sexy ladies and send them to Otacon in the tanker stage. Or shoot loads of birds in the big shell stage and wait for a little codec call from Colonel Campbell. The possibilities are endless and you are a fucking god if you can find them all. And I'm just gonna spoil one little thing, so do you know what, I'll just give you a second to skip it if you want. There's another little thing that I love, which is the Escape from New York reference, when Snake fakes his death and alter egos himself as Iroquois Pliskin, a direct homage to Snake Pliskin from the movie. Did you get it? Because it's Snake and Pliskin, and they look the same, and they got the, s the same names. She get it. And the music is even more professional than before, using a well-renowned cinematic composer, Harry Gregson Williams, who created some of the most memorable themes and epic, exciting and moving scores from any video game I've ever heard. And let's of course not forget about the boss battles. They're shit. Fantastic. Tits. Like before, the Dead Cell members, similar to Foxhound, had very unique and special ways of killing you. And you had to implement every unique and special way to take them down. They are all very different, innovative along with the game's design from the first game, challenging and memorable yet again. And with the same kind of variety from the last game, translated with the updated game mechanics. And let's not forget the EPIC PEOPLE IN TURN OUT THE BOSS LEVEL MUSIC Fun fact. Did you know that Vamp was originally designed as a woman, but the inclusion of Fortune then led them to change him to a man? This kind of explains his borderline feminine body actions, eh? And where these boss battles may not measure up to the innovation of Psycho Mantis per se, they still rock your socks off. Holy shit. Where did my socks go? I've lost my socks. They've blown away from the boss battles. I've lost my socks. Where have they... I... Ow, bugger it. And... Does Metal Gear Solid 2 hold up today? Well, to quote a very famous review of this game, it boils down to this. You need to play Metal Gear Solid 2. Ignore the bitches that moan about Raiden, this game is still brilliant and it's a very good successor to the first. Whether or not I prefer it is debatable, but it's still top notch. I mean, this was the first game to ever make me cry. Now that's saying something. It was before my dinner time, and then a scene came on. A certain scene involving a certain death with a certain character. And I really couldn't go downstairs to eat no matter how much mum called me. I was in a right state, the cutting was too long, and I just lost my appetite. It was sad. The end. This game was even considered the originator in what we call nowadays to be postmodern video gaming, due to its artistic expressionism, controversial and philosophical themes, and innovation for gaming in general, let alone for a sequel. But saying that, there were even extensive cuts to make the game more fun. For example, there was a flood section when the tanker sank in the beginning of the game that was actually removed, because Kojima just said it wasn't actually that fun, and he was quoted on sacrificing eye candy for the sake of the gameplay. What a babe. And I really don't like spoiling on this show, so I won't. But in the last portion of this game, after Raiden is tortured, I played that bit for the first time at half past midnight in the pitch black. And if you know what bit I'm talking about, I hope you can understand that it completely and utterly scared the shit out of me. And I'd call it one of the best video game twists of all time. It's a right mindfuck. What is it though? Well, play it to find out. Needless to say, at the end of the game, you fight about 80 ray machines, you stop Solidus and Dead Cell, learn a lot about the Patriots and other secrets, learn more about yourself and society, and then Snake leaves Raiden to try and live a normal life and try and find something worth living for and passing down and all that blah 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 shit. Should you play this one? Well, overall, it's actually been called the fourth highest rated PS2 game of all time, and the joint sixth highest rated overall video game of all time. And if those reviews there don't illustrate that point enough, then don't bother. How exactly was Kojima gonna top this one? I don't know. Yesterday.